Nevertheless, we have precisely the situation in Mesoamerica, most powerfully attested with the translation of the glyphs that outline the political overlordship of such places as Tikal and Kalakmul, among others. On top of the dead-on accuracy of the king over kings in the Lamanite territory, we have another somewhat unusual set of circumstances for which there's a clear Mesoamerican precedent. Lamoni and Ammon are traveling together so that Lamoni could persuade a king with whom he is friendly to release Ammon's brethren. It's very important to understand that we're not likely to be speaking here of friends in the modern sense of the world. They may certainly be friendly, but these are two kings, and they rule over different cities. In the Mesoamerican context, we'll replace in the events of the Book of Mormon, such a friend is an ally. City-states in Mesoamerica were frequently at war with other cities. Alliances were forged and broken. Among the allied kings, however, there were frequently formal visits to allied cities that had strong political overtones. These are listed in the glyphs. There's text that, uh, in stone, make sure they mention when these people are going back and forth and making these site visits. Thus, when Lamoni declares Antiongo as a friend, he is more probably indicating that this is an ally with whom there are some mutual expectations. The arrival of a king from one city to another was an occasion that later years would be sufficiently significant to commission a record in stone. This is no casual meeting of friends who went bowling together every Tuesday. This is a formal exchange of state, and it's in this very formal setting that we must understand the nature of the flattery that Lamoni suggested that he was going to have to use to free Ammon's brother. Remember that this is a king who's trying to persuade a king to reverse a king's decision. You know how difficult that is in history when you have a king who has to say, oops, sorry, I was wrong, I'll do it some other way. Kings don't like to do that. So we have a formal arrangement. The nature of Mesoamerican intersite visits also explains Lamoni fa Lamoni's father's visit to Lamoni. We are told that he comes because Lamoni did not attend a designated feast in the overking city. Without a cultural context in which to see this event, we simply have an irritated father coming to chastise a son. In the context of the important political balance associated with Mesoamerican intersite visits, we have the overking investigating a possible defection from this coalition. And there's a lot more sense that he'd come to check that out. The last odd circumstance of this occasion is the one-to-one -one battle of the overking and Ammon. This event should not happen in the canons of Western thought. It is unthinkable for a king to travel without an army to do his fighting for him. We do not know whether or not such an army, such an army was with Lamoni's father, but we do know that they didn't enter into that conflict. They could have been there. We don't know. All we know is that this overcame, who had a seated son. This is a man who was old enough to have a son, who was old enough to be a king. Think about that one. And he is giving hand-to-hand -hand battle to Ammon. And he probably doesn't know it, but this is the guy that's been slicing up people's arms in recent history. This is not a fair fight. Why does the king, why does the father of Lamoni pick it? Why does this older man, who probably can see that he doesn't have all that much of a chance against a younger and stronger man, what in the world is he doing with one-to-one -one combat? The answer to that is, again, Mesoamerica. The glory of Mesoamerica is in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And all of the stone records exalt the captives that the king takes himself. And there's one particular record of uh, a king at age 80 who is taking captives. Uh, the people who translated that particular text said, well, he must have had somebody else fighting for him. But there are enough of these of recently aged men fighting that it's entirely possible they really do have an 80-year-old man out there who may have been set up to take the captives. But we have an 80-year-old king out there taking captives. That's what he's doing here. He is a king, and he must participate in hand-to-hand -hand battle. Oh, page too far. Mesoamerican politics and religion can join to provide a background to yet another story from the Book of Mormon that's problematic without such a context. I'll tell this one I can get through it faster. Story of the anti nephi Levites. Really a cool story because we have the story of these people who decide that they're Lamanites. They've joined the church. They decided that now that they're members of the church, they're going to lay down their arms. And so they do. Lamanites come up to them, and they just sit there, passive resistance, no arms at all, and they get whacked to death. And pretty soon it says in the text that the Lamanites even got tired of this kind of slaughter. But what's really fascinating is right after the story, it says that they were still bloodthirsty. They didn't have enough of killing people who weren't fighting back. 
And so they said, you know, what we really got to do is go wipe out Ammon Ikon. And so right after this, they head off to a city that's a long distance away, kill a bunch of people, take a few captives, and come back. And it's a long way to go for a drink, even if it is blood thirst. So we have this really strange thing. The next thing that's strange is we have a parent exaltation of the concept of pacifism in the Book of Mormon. We think this is really cool because they lay down their arms. Nobody else does. Nowhere else in the Book of Mormon does anybody lay down their arms and die. They all pick up their arms and go fight. What do you mean? They, I mean, we exalt Captain Moroni because he put this title of liberty together, so let's go fight, boys. You know, how come we're not exalting them like the anti nephi Lehites? The next thing that's really curious about this one is that it only applies to a certain generation. Their sons were under the same obligation. Well, why is it okay for their sons? It's not okay for them. Next thing is they keep talking about why they had to lay down their arms. It says it's because of our murders. Well, okay, maybe the people who were fighting in war would define what they did as a murder, but that's pretty unusual. Uh, military never defines it as, as murder. Uh, we have casualties, we have a number of euphemisms, uh, but we never murder anybody when we go to war. So it's really strange that they are going to call it murders. And the second thing is, it's all the women and the older children who also are saying, hey, we have this problem with our murders. And when did the women and children over a certain age ever murder anybody? The best American context that answers all of those interesting little sets of problems is the cult of war. The Maya were obsessed with the cult of war. It is written in their stones. It is exalted in everything that we have found out about them. For a number of years, there was the idea that uh, you know, the Maya were these peaceful, stargazing priests. We've now learned that these are the most bloodthirsty people that have ever lived on the planet. Uh, the Maya, the Aztec, get the bad rap for putting people on the stones and ripping their hearts out. And at least that was quick. The Maya were very frequently very slow about it uh, and tortured their victims. Uh, it really wasn't very nice of them at all. There are parts of the cult of war that are very important for us to understand. And one of the major ones is that the cult of war had multiple purposes, some of which was to secure a territory. But what they would do is if move anybody in, they would set up a tribute system. You see that happening throughout the Book of Mormon, where rather than a place being conquered, they said, yeah, why don't you just give us some stuff? Um, the other thing that happens in the cult of war is that it is involved with captives. You are to take the captives in battle and you bring them back, and what you do with the captives after you bring them back is you sacrifice them to gods. And this is, theologically for them, what makes the world go round. Now, we are in a Lamanite situation, and we have Lamanites who join the church, and you can imagine that if you had to join the church and all of a sudden completely change your worldview, what makes the world go around is not the blood of these sacrificed captives, but the blood of the Savior. Uh, it's not the continual sacrifice of humans, but the sacrifice of our hearts, that the science of the world is completely different, that we begin to understand why they said that it was something that was so hard for them to do. They not only had to give up a religion, they had to give up an entire cosmology, an entire way of seeing how the world worked. Now the next thing that we learned is that it's got to be generational because it's a particular generation of people who believed in this. And just like a drunk does not want to, a reformed alcoholic doesn't want to return to alcohol, it's very understandable that these people who had left the cult of war would not want to return to anything that would have brought back those feelings that they were trying to get rid of. But because it's that one generation, their children, young children, who had not taken the covenant because they had not been part of that cult, had not been indoctrinated in it, would not have had any reason uh, to believe that way and not have had the same danger. So we can find a generational reason. We also find a reason why the women would have been under the, uh, the, uh, the cloud of the murders because they would have been willing participants in the society to sacrifice those men. On top of all of that, we have a few other things that are kind of interesting. One of them is that they bury their weapons. Uh, I've heard people talk about, well, maybe this is where you get the idea of burying the hatchet. No, that's not probably not right. Uh, but there is a Mesoamerican reason behind what they did. When Mesoamericans had sets of goods that they wanted to dedicate to the gods, they would cache them. And the word cache means they bury them. And we dig up all the time 
caches of things that were offered to God. And if they are going to give up their arms and do it for a religious purpose, it certainly would make some sense that they're going to give it up for God and that they would see as a 